How do you get the products you want? Deliver this to Dan Hill. For Dan Hill? Oh no, thank you. I actually don't need this anymore. The Silk Road was one of the most important developments of not only the Han Dynasty, but the ancient world as well. The Silk Road was a trade network that spanned from ancient China all the way to Rome. It wasn't a single road, of course, but instead several routes and spurs that eventually connected and allowed goods and ideas to travel back and forth. The most common route was from China to the Mediterranean, and it was over 5,000 miles long. It'd take traders over four months just to get halfway. That being said, people rarely traveled the entirety of the Silk Road. In fact, the goods traveled much farther than any person. Traveling the Silk Road was difficult. Caravans of men and camels traveled together for protection, often hiring armed guards to protect them from bandits. Its geography was also intimidating. The Silk Road passed through nearly every climate and terrain. While there were many routes, most caravans would have traveled through some combination of the gravel of the Gobi Desert, the high peaks of the Himalayas, and the steep walls of the Indus River Gorge. This route was, in reality, actually two separate routes, from China to Central Asia and the Mediterranean to Central Asia. And what did those two routes have in common? Central Asia was the keystone of the Silk Road. The kingdoms and the people of Central Asia were nomads. These nomads spent a lot of time moving around tending to domesticated animals, which made them naturally well suited to moving trade goods as well. It was through these people's lands, and you weren't making it through without their permission, and also these people that connected the two great empires of antiquity, the Han and the Roman empires. While many Chinese historians point to the Chinese general, Zhang Jian, as sparking the Silk Road, there's a tinderbox for the trade route that existed long before. There's evidence that China had already been trading with Central Asia as early as the 1500s BCE. And Darius I's royal road, coupled with the conquest of Alexander the Great, set up trade from the Mediterranean to Central Asia. And once this road ignited, it led to the exchange of new products, ideas, and technology across Eurasia. In 128 BCE, General Zhang Jian returned to China from Central Asia, possibly after having been imprisoned there for 10 years. He returned with tales of great riches and horses that outclass any he had seen before. Emperor Wudi was intrigued by the horses and sent out armies to conquer lands in Central Asia, and Zhang Jian ultimately led 18 expeditions to trade. The Han Dynasty was able to stabilize the region and make it safer to travel. As trade increased, the Han Dynasty also extended the Great Wall and stationed military outposts to aid in security. If you have no clue what the Han Dynasty was, click that card and watch the video. Because of the wealth that the trade generated, as well as the increased security, cities began to form. Many of these cities ended up becoming very popular and rich. The large caravans of people and camels had to stop frequently for food and water. They also bartered or traded for goods along the way as well. Chinese farmers also followed suit. They moved westward and began working these lands that surrounded the new cities. Silk was the most popular good traded, hence why historians today call it the Silk Road. Silk was incredibly useful. It was used as writing material, fishing line, as well as clothes. Though Silk's popularity outside of China was pretty much limited to just clothing. China grew very wealthy off of silk. Rome even attempted to ban silk because of a perceived trade imbalance, along with thoughts that it was immodest but silk still remained popular. Silk wasn't the only good traded. Roman glassware was sought after in China, and across the entirety of the trade network, people traded for tools, art. Uh, well, it would just be quicker if we did this. Traders and goods were not the only things that traveled the Silk Road. 
musicians, performers, monks, and pilgrims traveled as well, exchanging their languages, knowledge, and technology along the way. The Chinese, in particular, introduced the world to papermaking as well as new metalworking and irrigation techniques. This is an example of diffusion, where goods, ideas, and technologies can spread from one culture to another. Religions also diffused along this trade network. One of the most influential to come to China was Buddhism. As the Han Dynasty began to destabilize during the late 100 CE, violence became more and more common. This left many turning to traditional Chinese religions and philosophies to try and explain why they were all suffering. Taoism and Confucianism really didn't provide the answers that people sought. Then in comes Buddhism from India, with its Four Noble Truths and its Eightfold Path. Many Chinese were immediately drawn to this. I mean, remember, the very first of the Four Noble Truths is, life is suffering. Or, as I like to say, life sucks. Really spoke to them. Buddhism in China ended up being slightly different than in India. For starters, the ideas of Taoism were incorporated when Indian monks would make connections with Taoism to help explain this new to China religion. The Chinese also imported some of the elements of Confucianism as well. Some notable differences that developed are that Chinese Buddhists see Buddha as divine, and Nirvana is more than just an escape from reincarnation, and it's kind of like having the ultra premium club pass to heaven. Some even believe that there are multiple levels of nirvana, with each one being more incredible than the previous. Even though Roman and Chinese goods were regularly traded in each other's countries, there's not a lot of evidence of any direct contact. Both were vaguely aware of each other's existence, but because of the vast distance between them, they weren't able to interact. In fact, the Romans, not knowing that peaches and apricots were actually of Chinese origin, called them Persian plums and Armenian apples, which are regions closer to the Mediterranean than they are to China. Not directly knowing each other didn't hurt trade, though. Many merchants were able to grow quite rich off of trade, and China itself became wealthy just off of silk production alone, let alone all of its other trade goods. Silk Road also influenced people's lives in new ways too. Even though most people couldn't have afforded the namesake cloth that the trade network is famous for, the increased demand meant that more people were needed to produce it, creating jobs. There were a couple of downsides, such as stated in John Green's Crash Course World History video, that this interconnectedness also meant the spread of diseases. It's believed that the bubonic plague originated in China and eventually ended up killing nearly half of Europe's population because of this global trade. Similar to how the coronavirus was spread because of our globalized economy. Yet, the Silk Road was still a net benefit for society. People suddenly had access to new foods, products, ideas, and technology that they'd never had before. And it improved a lot of people's lives. Anyways, I hope you're having a wonderful week. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. And until next time, I will miss you terribly.